Good morning, Common Ground. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here with you this morning. It's uh, to hear the music, the choir, wonderful. I often go online to hear your music and to uh, participate in your powerful worship that you have here week after week. What a beautiful song, uh, particularly uh, for what we're celebrating this week and Thanksgiving. It is said that Thomas Aquinas, at the end of his life, who had written so many books, and I know we have many chaplains here in the congregation who have probably read all or most of his works, his Summa Theologica, which is uh, his main work, very long tome. But at the end of it all, he was asked, so, so Thomas, what? How would, you, how would you summarize all your life's work? And he said, it's like rubbish. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I hope that we don't have to get to the end of our life to know that simple truth. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So I know this is also a very intelligent group, violinists and many uh, playing instruments and beautiful vocalists. Um, so you probably know the answer to this question. So I'll ask our youth, what key doesn't open anything? What key doesn't open anything? Do, 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 do. Any guesses? Think of Thursday. Turkey. <laughs> well, you probably had to be from Shikshini, Pennsylvania to get that one. That's my hometown. <laughs> well, today we're going to talk a little bit about the key, not only to Thanksgiving, but the key to life, life everlasting. In 1871, the Treaty of Frankfurt was signed. And that treaty was between Prussia and France. And in the treaty, there was a war indemnity clause. And that indemnity said that France would pay for all the losses incurred by Prussia. Now that war indemnity in modern costs would be one billion dollars. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of zeros for me, for this chaplain who's not very good at math. One billion dollars. Indemnity. It's a legal term that says that another party will pay for your loss, for your damages. Something happens to you someone else will pay that price. They'll clear your debt. That's indemnity. We see a little bit of that going on today in the scripture from Matthew chapter 18. Now before we get into the chapter, let's back it up a little bit because it's a great chapter, like all the chapters in the Bible are. But this chapter 18 opens up with the disciples asking Jesus, who, is, who will be the greatest in heaven? And Jesus then says, um, you, need, you need to change your thinking, basically, right? You need not to be thinking about who will be the greatest in heaven. But let me tell you how God thinks. And he tells them, about having the attitude of a child. A child doesn't think about positions or status. 
right? A child doesn't look at those things. As adults, we do, don't we? We look at protocol, particularly in the military. Who should go where? Who should go first? Who should go last? We do that in our own culture. We give people certain status because of their positions. But that's not how God thinks. Even from the time when David was anointed as king, he wasn't even at the meal where the prophet had said, bring the family together because one of your sons will be anointed king. David was the youngest. He was still out with the sheep. And Samuel said, go get him. Because God looks in at the heart. Humans, we look at the outside, don't we? I'm wearing a very special brooch this morning. It's a big brooch, so you probably have seen it already. If you didn't see it before I got up here to the pulpit. It's special not because it is a symbol of our global dominance, our military might and power, but because five special families gave me this brooch when I left Washington the first time. And it's five-sided and we all worked around Washington. And they were five families that were core of a very special chapel congregation there at Fort Bel Belvoir Chapel Next. So when I see this brooch, I think of five special friends, dear friends. We need to think and look with eyes like God. We need to look in at the heart. We need to reimagine for our culture and for our families and for our organizations how we look at things. Jesus then goes on to talk about um, the hundred sheep, right? And there's one sheep that's lost. Now, if it were me, I might cut my losses. That, you know, that might be a tax write-off. You know, I got 99, that's pretty good. But Jesus says, no. The shepherd goes looking for that one lost sheep. And when that one sheep is found, there is great rejoicing. God thinks differently. God looks at the world much different than we do and our culture does. And so when Peter asks this question, he's looking for some clarification, right? Don't we want nice, clear guidance? What should I do? So Peter says, should we forgive seven times? Because three was the general rule, right? I, I know we've got parents here today, right? A lot of parents. You probably have an internal, maybe, number count. How many times am I going to forgive? You know? Well, in the, in the Jewish law, it was three times. And then that was it. So Peter actually goes over double that when he says, you know, should we forgive seven times? And again, Jesus comes at it from a very different approach. It's not about how many, three, seven. And some interpret, translate the scripture as 70 times seven. So it's like this, this really big number. If you look at three and what Peter asks about, you know, should it be seven? No, 70 times seven. 
Don't, don't think about it as, a, as so many. Forgive. 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 And why does he say that? When he talks, when Jesus shares this next parable, there's a man with a debt that's brought in. He's probably already in jail. And so he's drug out, is what the the Greek has a sense of being drug out in front of the master. And in modern terms, it's $4 billion. $4 billion. Now, there's only a few people on the planet that could pay a debt like that today, right? So for everybody else on the planet, 8 billion people, we, we wouldn't be able to pay that. It's, it's an un, unpayable debt. For billion dollars. And this, this servant begs for mercy. And he said, I'll, I'll pay it back. And what does the master? The master has mercy on him and forgives this enormous debt. He clears it. He clears his tab. And in this parable, of course, the man goes out. And someone who owes him in a modern day amount $4,000, right? Which I think, you know, maybe most of us could probably manage $4,000. He has no mercy on him. You know, even if we need a little bit of time, we could probably come up with that $4,000, right? Same with this man. Hey, give me some more time. I, you know, let's, let's work this out. No mercy has him thrown in jail. And when the master hears about this, he's understandably irate. And I think, what happened to that man? What happened to the one whose debt was unpayable and cleared, how could he do that? How could he turn around and have no mercy on someone who owed him a few thousand dollars? Did he, did he maybe feel just a sense of entitlement? Did he feel um, relief? And it was just a passing? Maybe just, hey, whew. I dodged that bullet. I sense that he did not have a heart of gratitude, right? Johannes Gertner, who escaped Nazi Germany, he said, you know, to talk about gratitude is very courteous and pleasant. To enact gratitude is to be generous and noble. But to live gratitude is to touch heaven. To live gratitude is to touch heaven. I wonder if that that man even talked about being grateful. I wonder if that's us this morning. Is that us this morning? Do we talk a good game when it comes to gratitude? Or maybe we go the next step and we enact gratitude. I I know Common Grounds. I could see your bags back there. You're generous. You're generous with your ties with your offerings, you're taking care of the soldiers in quarantine, you're getting these bags out to those who may be listening right now. You care. You're grateful. 
you enact gratitude. You're generous. You're noble. But are we missing that third step to live gratitude? I look at um, the 10 lepers that Jesus healed. Now, leprosy was a terrible disease. Still is. There's still leprosy on the planet and very small, thank God. But an awful, awful disease where people had to be quarantined because very highly contagious. So people who had leprosy, they went off and they lived together. So we know we can identify with that, can we not? Living in isolation, living in quarantine, being physically distanced. Jesus heals 10 with leprosy. How many came back to thank Jesus? One person. One person. Are we, who are we in that? Are we one of the nine or one of the ten? And when we do come back and thank, thank God for the blessings, when we count our mes- many blessings, what are we thanking God for? If we were to count our blessings, we'd just keep going and going, wouldn't we? And I think about um, one of the things I, you know, I, I think is a perk as a, as a clergy. Um, I've been celebrating communion fairly often during the pandemic. And uh, start out the opening prayer, and I find it's often a litany of things I'm grateful for. I thank God for another day. I thank God for a beautiful morning. I thank God uh, for faith and family and freedom and friends. All these things, I think, wow, I've just gone down this list of things, these, these blessings, these treats, if you will, from the Lord. And then I get to the great thanksgiving in the communion service. And that great thanksgiving gives God thanks for the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. That's the great thanksgiving. When we thank God for his greatest gift in his son, Jesus Christ, we touch heaven. I think of Mary Magdalene. When she wept tears on Jesus' feet, She washed Jesus' feet with her tears. She she broke the nard that cost a year's wages and anointed the feet of Jesus. Mary Magdalene touched heaven because she knew that her debt that she could never pay was paid by Jesus. She was forgiven by Jesus. She knew that, and her heart was full of gratitude, and her tears flowed from that heart of gratitude. Mary Magdalene touched heaven What did others say at that dinner? Oh, shouldn't do that. Why is this prostitute at Jesus' feet? Church, is that us? Is that us? I think of my thanksgiving and the litany of thanking God for his blessings. My first thanks should be that Jesus has paid the debt that I could never repay.
the rich, the, remember the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus, right? He's, he's coming to Jesus. You can, just, you can just tell he's confident in who he is. Jesus, what must you do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, hey, you, you have followed all the commandments. And can't you just feel the, the swelling of pride in the young man? Yes. Yes, in fact, I have kept all the commandments. Well, then Jesus says, go and sell everything you have and follow me. What does the rich young ruler do then? He went away sad. He went away sad. He believed he was entitled, didn't he? He was entitled to everlasting life. I have, I've been good. I've been righteous. I've been religious. Brothers and sisters, I think that's a condemna condemnation against us today. We, we in our prosperity, we are buffered. We are comfort, comfortable. We don't know truly the debt that has been paid for us. Jesus has paid the price. He signs his name on that indemnity clause for you and for me. Let's look at another I word. There are three things that um, it is said that people want. They want the back of the church, the front of the bus, and a lot of Facebook uh, friends. <laughs> But what is it we should really want today, right? What do people really want? Immunity, right? Immunity from this virus. The we want the front of the vaccine line so we can have immunity. Brothers and sisters, we, we already have immunity. We have the most important immunity there is. That vaccine will only give us immunity against COVID-19. That's very temporal. That's very, that's very earthly. That's very now. The immunity that we have through Christ is for eternity. That immunity we already have when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Psalm 136 is a litany of thanksgiving. It goes through all the things that God has done. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. And in the message it says, God's love never quits. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God's love never quits. God's love never quits on you. God's love forgives you, gives you mercy, gives you immunity against death, gives you life eternal. Brothers and sisters, a debt has been paid. That is our great thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Cheek. G.K. Chesterton said, the critical thing is whatever, whether you take things for granted or you take them with gratitude. I say, brothers and sisters, let's get beyond the courteous, pleasant talking about Thanksgiving. Let us even go beyond being generous and noble. Let us touch heaven as we come before our great and merciful God, whose God, whose love never quits for us, and thank him that he went to the cross 
for us. Let us pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you have paid it all on the cross. We could never pay through our righteousness, through our status, through our positions, but only you, God, could pay the price. God, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that does not know what you have done for them and that your love does not quit, it's full of mercy and grace, God, I pray they would know it today and they would receive immunity, immunity from death and receive the gift of everlasting life in Jesus our Savior. God, let us raise our voices in song, knowing that you have paid it all and we are debt-free. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.